That's what guns are for. Pull the trigger. End my life. Simple, isn't it? Why don't you do it? Then, look at me in the eye. Pull the trigger. End my life. Hello and welcome back to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host, McGee Dam, and today we're going to be talking about The Happiness Patrol, written by Graham Curry and directed by Chris Clout. This is one of the most infamous Doctor Who stories of the classic era. Not for being so absolutely amazing or having anything uh, really noteworthy in terms of its uh, canon influence influences, but mainly uh, for the fact that it is pure camp. Now, strange thing to note about this story is that uh, when it came out, it was considered one of the worst stories. People hated it, thought it was um, just cheesy kids. There were a lot of like, stupid moments. And the, the political theme in of it was... Uh, not very subtle, although I don't know if anybody criticised that at the time. I'm just stating that um, the subtlety in it isn't what this story has going for it. But what I find interesting uh, doing my research on like fans' um, opinions on this, or at least the majority anyway, is that it seems like in recent years... It's becoming like, it's slowly becoming a fan favourite. Some people like it because it's so bad it's good. And they can just laugh at it, just how stupid it is. But there are actual people who actually really enjoy this story. And not only see a much more... Uh, and uh, appreciate the story for its theming of Margaret Thatcher. And... Um, the, the ideologies of 80s uh, television in general. Uh, so that's really interesting. Uh, what I personally find really funny is that this story kind of has a remake as well in the terms of its ideas and its um, the plot elements in the story. As in the 12th Doctor story, Smile, deals with a very similar premise in which you've got to be happy in public constantly, otherwise um, you, you're basically found as a criminal. So I find that extremely interesting. Um, yes, this story is notorious for a few of its aspects, one of them being the notorious Candyman, um, who makes his only television story in this. Uh, fun fact, um, he, they, BBC actually almost got sued by a sweet factory who proclaimed that the Candyman was ripping off their um, trademark, their mascot. And the BBC promised that they would never use the Candyman again, that it was a one-time off. Um, only for years later, to Candyman to return in the audio adventures... Um, in the Ravenous box sets, I believe it is, in the Eighth Doctor Adventures. However, he takes the form of a human body in that story, and so the, um, the BBC's promise is technically still um, uh, justified. Don't know. Um, so, yeah, it's one of those, it's one of those um, stories. Um, the villain of it, Helen A, uh, the actress who played her, actually asked uh, John Nathan Turner if she gets cast, can she play her as an evil Margaret Thatcher? Because she, quote, hated Margaret Thatcher with a passion, which was right up um, Andrew Cartnell's um, street, who I've stated before, every story in his era, in some way, shape or form, is a commentary on Margaret Thatcher's way of running the country, whether it is extremely obvious in this story or it's like so subtle that you won't really um, think about it like in other stories that we've tackled. Um, so very interesting here. 
So the Doctor and Ace land on a human colony. Um, I believe it's on a on a on a planet on a place, um, and like I said, it's a place where happiness is the law and uh, misery is forbidden. In fact, one of the earliest scenes that we see is a detective, um, uh, a man in disguise. Um, he sees a a sad woman and he offers her the opportunity to go to a secret place where she can express her depression and express her misery um, and when she goes yes okay he gives her his card and he says to turn it around and it says the happiness patrol um, secret agent and so he arrests her on the spot um, <laughs> This character does that twice, where he gives somebody a card uh, with a name and then turn it around and it's like, Secret Detective. Oh, oh no. Now what's really funny about this story is that the production and the scripts don't really match well. Uh, this could be a Chris Clout, just like a oh, bit of overseeing. Um, basically what happened was this. In the original script, the story was actually supposed to take place throughout a few days. However, because of production and issues and stuff, it was decided to make the entire story um, under one night at the very end of the Happiness Patrol's rule, Hell and Ale's rule. Uh, and so the set has a very dark and gloomy aspect to it, um, with the exception of this upbeat music that plays like in the distance. And it doesn't gel well with the script for the majority of the story because it's supposed to be this really happy, ongoing place. But it's really depressing looking. And it doesn't help that, um, that the script actually makes reference to it. Um, Ace says that she doesn't like it here. When the doctor asks why, she says it's too happy, too phony. It's, it's like everybody's just pretending to put a smile on their face just for the sake of it. And nobody's actually really happy. Um, but if you look around the set, it's all miserable and dark and gloomy. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Chris Clout, as I've stated before, is one of my least favourite classic Who directors. He has done really good work. Um, and even in his Doctor Who stories, there are some good stuff that he's done. But I think... The majority of his work is very weak and I think that could just be due to uh, the production at the time being a very uh, quick succession and very struggles behind the scenes with Michael Gray trying to cancel the show so I don't put it against him but um, yeah I don't think he's a particularly strong director working at this, um, at this pace. Um, a lot of the story kind of feel, a lot of the directing kind of feels half done. Um, the, there's something off about the whole look of it, the whole appeal of it. And the costumes as well look so phony with the exception of one which looks so good in my opinion. But also looks very, but just the, con the idea of it is very... A very just out of this world crazy that like you're just like what the hell um but anyways the doctor and uh ace actually try and get themselves arrested because the doctor feels like there's something strange in the air something mysterious he's actually come in here intentionally to try and pick a fight essentially and he meets up with the happiness patrol who's been actually been painted in the TARDIS pink whilst they've been wandering around. And the first of all, um, the Doctor um, and Ace tries to act like they're happy, they're trying to act like they're, they're trying to be really smug by the fact that they have come in and tried to wreck stuff up. However, they don't arrest them until one of them notices that Ace is wearing like dark clothing and uh, the doctor like, kind of like clicks that they're, they, they're constantly in a mood of happiness. So he does kind of like bring up some like depressing ideas. 
and then one of them actually then arrests them and takes them to the waiting room. And one of my favourite scenes, which I don't think anyone talks about, and it's actually a huge part of the Cardinal Master Plan. When I say huge, huge in terms of the idea of making the Doctor a much more mysterious figure. The Andrew Cardinal's version of the Cardinal Master Plan is in which uh, they're in the waiting room and they basically meet up this guy who's been playing a coin machine. Um, and he describes himself as a killjoy, somebody who can't, who doesn't want to be happy. Um, who wants to enjoy his misery and suffering and just wants to like see the reality of the world instead of just being happy, happy, happy. Um, um, they call it the waiting room, but really it's a prison, which is kind of like the irony of the story. Kind of like a uh, 1984 kind of um, idea. And what happens then is that because um, Helen A sees this character playing with the machine, it's kind of it's booby-trapped to electrocute him and kill him. And what happens then is easily my favourite moment in this story and shows the darkness of the Doctor. Or at least one of the scenes in here that shows the darkness of the Doctor. Ace goes around the body and is like, you killed him. Um, and the, the woman on guard is like, good, he was a killjoy. He was just making everyone depressed. And Ace is about to lunge herself at her. It's like, you cruel git, I'm gonna... And the doctor grabs her Ace by the arms. It's like, no, don't, Ace. You're not good to me like this. That line is like so abrupt, so quick. But you think about the doctor and Ace's relationship. And you're like, and personally, I'm just like, oh my God, that's really... Doctor, that's really bad. That's really, that's really disturbing from your point of view. You're supposed to be this fun traveller who goes around the universe experiencing the galaxy with friends and uh, friends and loved ones. But Ace being angry by somebody's death um, and her being a fact is no good to him. Is He's basically using her as a pawn. Uh, not to say that they're not good friends, but he, he sees her as an inferior, lesser being who he needs to use. And that shows here um, the aspect of it, which is really mental. Um, and I'm so disappointed that this scene doesn't actually get talked about a lot. Um, we actually do have a really great scene that's similar to that, but plays out for a lot more longer later on in the story, uh, which we'll be tackling. And that's a really powerful scene. See, there's a lot of great moments in this story. And, um, and the Doctor and Ace escape on a go-kart. Um, uh, they first initially is like... Um, uh, it's just a waiting room. They could leave any time they want, um, providing that they don't cross a particular line. Um, there's a go-kart in their way which they could use. Uh, but when the Doctor realises that nobody's going to stop them if they use it, um, the Doctor's like, it's boogie-trapped. And so the Doctor um, tampers with it to take away the, the bombing device. And so Ace and... Uh, the Doctor escape uh, only to get only a few miles away where it breaks down and when the Doctor tries to fix it um, Ace distracts the happiness patrol to save uh, to give the Doctor more time only for the Ace to go into prison with another character I believe her name was Susie Q um, who states that um, she just woke up one moment and she got sick of all this happiness all this pretense um, so yeah, a lot of the ideas and the themes of this story is basically the false nature of constantly being happy. Now this was really relevant in the 1980s and what's really, um, what actually what makes this story kind of hold up is that this actually plays very well today. Um, back, in, back in the 80s was the start really of 
of news have it they talk about uh, the depressing and the darkness of the world but they'd always try and soften it up and hide the fact um, uh, especially when it came to television like example like you've got like um, people starving and dying of Ebola and stuff but no don't watch that. forget about that all those worries are far away look at happy look at all these really funky music videos look at these hot celebrities look at these um, just constantly be happy come on um, like Disney like Disney constantly you're like forget about your worries nothing will ever go wrong for you just constantly be happy never be sad um, and yeah it still plays a well today especially with the advert of um, YouTube where news is constantly made as a joke I mean look at the basically this story was talking about Margaret Thatcher it could easily apply to Donald Trump I mean think about it Trump has done horrible things during his time he's locked and starved children uh, during the Mexico uh, at the Mexican border he's done hugely racist sexist and monogynist things so, um, um, cutting funds for uh, transgender health care and just all these horrible stuff but because he's a meme because he's a joke he gets away with it and this story is is that it can easily apply to that and that's what I think that's why I think a lot of people resonate with this story. A lot of people, it seems like more and more this time's been really friendly to this story. Unlike others like The Twin Dilemma and Time and the Rani which have uh, aged extremely poorly. Here the, ide the ideology, the theme in all this could easily apply to a modern sensibility and because of that it holds up. Despite it having a really cringy looking um, atmosphere and appearance and everybody wearing pink and glossy. Um, uh, there's also seemed to be a subtle um, gayness, a, su a subtle homosexuality to the story. Um, a lot of the male characters are wearing bright pink and wearing luxurious makeup. Um, a lot of like double characters um, are, are male. We've got um, Gilbert who created the machine. At least he describes he created the body anyway, but the mind of his of its own. So where he got the brain, we don't know. Of the candy man, the basically Helen A's um, executioner who forces people um, to eat sweets which are so sweet, so delicious, that it kills people. Although we never see that. We also see, we do see one of his methods where he basically um, puts people in a tube and basically drowns them with sweets. Um, um, it's, it's interesting to note that this was during a time when Doctor Who was trying to hide the violence that could be another thing about what this story is trying to talk about um during the 1980s starting with the peter davison era um heavily focused on uh, actually it started more in the, the tom baker era now that i think about it and was heavily criticized during the colin baker era was a doctor whose relationship with violence and so john nathan turner um usually try to, to try and tone down the violence as much as possible but here we see a person drowned by sweets and we see the dead body afterwards that is horrifying that is disgusting what's really great is is that you can't really criticize it if you try and go that's a bit too much you're completely missing the point of the story it's about not trying to hide it's about not trying to like gloss over the darker aspects of reality um and yeah uh the doctor has a few encounters with the candy man and they are absolutely hilarious 
they build up the Candyman as this ginormous threat. And he's the costume I was on about. This giant robot made out of candy. Um, which is just a, such a ridiculous concept. A candy creature robot. That you just can't help but laugh. And the actor who plays him, um, plays him way over the top. Um, and like I said, there's a sort of subtle homosexual uh, subtext in here between um, Gilbert and uh, the Candyman as they bicker on like a married couple. Um, and what's really funny, <laughs> this story is absolutely hilarious for the Candyman. When the Doctor escapes him the first time, he makes him um, uh, smash a lemonade bottle um, on his feet. And because he's made out of candy, he gets stuck. And so the Doctor um, escapes with a character called Earl. Now Earl, <laughs> I love Earl. He's this, um, he's this character that just randomly pops up here and there with a harmonica. Who likes playing uh, sad music until the Happiness Patrol appears and then he plays happy, joyful music. Um, and he's basically one of these like resistance to the Happiness Patrol. What I really like about Earl is just the way he appears and disappears throughout the story. He's basically like Gandalf from the Hobbit films where he just appears and disappears with no real explanation, no real context. He just appears uh, <laughs> to help the Doctor out and uh, he would have made a really great companion now that I think about it. But uh, what I want to talk about is, uh, so basically the Candyman gets stuck uh, here as the Doctor escapes and the Doctor goes and meets Helen A and he gets out um, two canisters from her office and uh, he asks then the Candyman for help. Um, and the Candyman's like, right, only if you, if you free me, then I'll help you. So the Doctor frees him by spraying on one of the other sprays. And the Candyman is like, thank you, Doctor. Now I'm going to kill you. And the Doctor gets the other canister, which is made out of lemonade, and squirts his legs again, but in the same situation, learning absolutely nothing. And what's really funny about this is that the Candyman just starts shouting, Gilbert! Gilbert! And just... Woo, this story is funny. Um, um, we also learn that there's been this protest. Um, a depressed protest. People who want to show their misery in public. And Helen A basically gets a few assassins, snipers, to kill them if they get too depressive. And the doctor witnesses this, or at least he sees that the guards are there. And we get the infamous scene, which is actually the scene I was quoted at the start, when he gets this, one of the snipers to put a gun right up to his head, showing um, Sylvester McCoy is most serious. A lot of people point to this as their favourite Seventh Doctor moment. And it is bloody awesome. As the Doctor basically is like egging him on a bit. It's like, come on, pull the trigger. You can't, can you? You can't just take a life when it's right in front of you. When it's so graphic and so real right up in your face. And he grabs the gun off him and tells his friend to drop his gun. <laughs> and then the Doctor just leaves. Uh, convincing them not to kill anyone. That is the doctor. He is the guy who would go to um, a gunfight with nothing but his words and convince his enemies to drop their weapons. Making that, That's why I love the doctor. Okay, sure, he does carry a gun once or twice, but he usually makes it a rule never to carry a gun. And he will, uh, at best, use non-violent methods whenever he can. 
which makes him such more a much more moral character in a way. But most superheroes who use violence, who punches and kicks their enemies down, whilst the Doctor convinces his enemies to drop their weapons for the majority of the bits. Um, unless he's tackling Daleks and Cybermen and Sontarans, all the big names. So that's really, I really like, um, really like that scene. Um, Helen A, um, she has this little character called, a little pet, a little creature she calls Fifi, uh, which is kind of like a half wolf, half dog with reptile spikes. And the prop looks absolutely ridiculous. It looks way too cheap. Which, you know, like I said, you can't really judge this era for being cheap when uh, the heads up at the BBC just weren't giving them any money. I believe it was around this time as well that in America, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation was airing. And the effects on that for a TV budget was just um, way, way beyond anything Doctor Who was doing. Which was kind of the reason end for its cancellation in 1989. Um, and basically the Empire is falling apart. And another subtle uh, uh, homoerotic theming of this story is actually... Um, Helen A actually has a husband who actually leaves her for a man. It's not implied to be any sort of relationship as far as we know... But he does leave with a man, and they seem to be in uh, close prometers from each other during the video clip of him revealing that basically he's leaving her. Uh, and he still wears his, like, really camp costume as well. Um, and the, stor the story's ending was really, really well done, in my opinion. Um... Well, like I say, it's 50-50. It's it depends on your point of view. Uh, it's not very subtle. Fun fact, um, the script was actually changed um, with the ending by Andrew Cartman and John Nathan Turner. And uh, f for the better, I think, Helen A basically explains that all she wanted to do is just to make people happy. Just... Um, she just wanted the people to enjoy. She just wanted to get rid of all miserable people. What's wrong with that? And the doctor's like, you're disallowing yourself one of the most strongest and powerfulest human emotions there are. Uh, the sadness, the fear, the depression. And Helen A is like, that's it, I'm getting out of here. You can all rot in hell. When all of a sudden... Um, by accident, I think, one of her guards um, accidentally kills um, Fifi, her pet. And she breaks down in tears and cries as she goes and hugs uh, Fifi's um, body. Uh, and the Doctor and Ace leaving the TARDIS then. Uh, I believe it's still pink by the end of the story. Um, I can't remember. It's really strange like that. Um, and people then celebrate as they're allow finally allowed to express their um, s most saddest and depressing thoughts in public for the first time in years. And that's the Happiness Patrol. Overall, it's one of those stories I believe not only is it surprisingly good, but I think it's actually improved uh, with age. A lot of the theming still applies to the today. Might even be more so, um, which is really interesting, I find. The, the campiness of its nature helps um, distract you from its very campy, um, very cheap, should I say, nuts of it. As, like, it doesn't try to hide the fact that it's cheap and it's on a low budget. The, the story is, it's kind of like it's proud of the fact. It's like, yes, we're cheap, we're amateurs at this, we have no idea what we're doing, but god damn it, we are going to make some goddamn entertainment. 
and I think there's a lot to enjoy here. Um, there are scenes which are pure gold, like the gun scene and the scene when um, the doctor tells Ace um, that she's no good to him like this, even if that bit is really short. Um, and you could easily miss that little moment. Um, but there's also some really stupid moments um, and parts of the plot really don't gel up as um, stuff with the Candyman never actually goes anywhere in terms of plot. The plot seems to be really distracted to tell this, uh, just to show really stupid and campy stuff. But it's a lot of fun and I highly recommend it. It's one of those stories I think you've got to watch at least once if you can call yourself a Doctor Who fan. You might not like it, you might absolutely hate it. But it's silly, it's ridiculous, it's over the top and it's something which you will never ever see anything like it again. So there you go, that's the Happiness Patrol. So join me next time where we will be uh, watching the true 25th anniversary of the story, which I believe is the only anniversary special that isn't a multi-doctor story. That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, so join me next time when the Doctor must confront um, neo-Nazis, Cybermen and an angel of some sort. So join me next time for Silver Nemesis and I'll see you next time on the Doctor Who Marathon. Ta-da!